Hey there guys, Paul here from the engineeringmindset.com. In this video, we're going to be looking at the DC motor to understand the basics of how it works. DC motors look something like this, although there are quite a few variations. These are used to convert electrical energy into mechanical energy, and we can use these, for example, in our power tools, our toy cars, and even our cooling fans. When we look at a DC motor, we first see the metal protective casing which forms the stator. At one end, we have the tip of a shaft protruding through the casing. We can attach gears, fan blades, or even pulleys onto this. On the other end, we have a plastic end cap with two terminals. We can connect a power supply to these terminals to rotate the shaft. If we remove the casing to look inside the motor, we first find two magnets inside. These are permanent magnets which form a north and south pole. Running through the center of the motor, we see this rod, which is called the shaft. The shaft is used to transfer mechanical energy. Attached to the shaft, we have the rotor. The rotor is made from a number of discs, which are laminated together. Each disc has these T-shaped arms cut into them. Wrapped around these T-shaped arms of the rotor are the coil windings, which carry the electrical current from the battery. As the current passes through the coils, it produces an electromagnetic field. We control the timing and the polarity of the magnetic field to create rotation. The ends of the coils are connected to the commutator. The commutator is a ring, which has been segmented into a number of plates which sit concentrically around the shaft. These plates are separated and electrically isolated from each other, as well as the shaft. The ends of each coil connect to a different commutator plate. They do this to create a circuit, and we'll see that in detail just shortly. Sitting within the plastic back cover are the brushes, brush arms, and terminals. The commutator plates sit between the two brushes. The brushes rub against the commutator segments to complete the circuit. Electricity can then flow through a terminal, through the arm, into the brush, through a commutator segment, into a coil, then out to another commutator segment, onto the opposite brush and arm, and back to the other terminal. These components give us our basic DC motor. To understand how the DC motor works, we need to understand some fundamentals of electricity, as well as how the components inside work. But first, where have you seen a DC motor used, or where could you apply one? Let me know your thoughts and project ideas in the comment section down below. Electricity is the flow of electrons through a wire. When lots of electrons flow in the same direction, we call this current. DC electricity means the electrons flow in just a single direction, from one terminal of a battery directly to the other. If we reverse the battery, then the current will flow in the opposite direction. Inside the copper wire, we find copper atoms. Orbiting each atom, we find free electrons. These are called free electrons because they are free to move to other atoms. They do naturally move to other atoms by themselves but this is in any and all directions at random, which is of no use to us. We need lots of electrons to flow in the same direction, and we can do that by applying a voltage. Voltage is like pressure and will force electrons to move. Electrons only flow in a complete circuit. They always try to get back to their source, so when we give them a path such as a wire, they will flow through this. Even if we temporarily create a path, they will take it as soon as it's available. We can place components in this path so that they have to flow through it, and that way they do work for us, such as illuminating the lamp. In these animations, we're going to be using two terms. That's electron flow and conventional current. Electron flow is what's actually occurring, with the electrons flowing from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. Conventional current moves in the opposite direction, from positive to negative. Just be aware of the two terms and which one we're using. As you probably already know, magnets are polarized with north and south ends. These types are known as permanent magnets because their magnetic field is always active. When in proximity with another magnet, the alike ends push away and the opposite ends attract. So we get these pushing and pulling forces caused by the magnetic field of the magnets. Magnets have these curved magnetic field lines which run from the north pole to the south pole and extend curving around the exterior. The magnetic field is most powerful at the ends, 
We see this because there are more magnetic fields closely packed together. We can actually see the magnetic field of a magnet by sprinkling some iron filings over the top. When two magnets are in close proximity to each other, the magnetic fields interact. Two alike ends will repel each other and the magnetic field lines will not join. However, two opposite polarities will be attracted to each other and the magnetic field lines will converge into a highly concentrated region. Therefore, we place two magnets of opposite polarities into the motor stator to form a strong magnetic field through the rotor. When we connect a wire to the positive and negative terminals of a battery, a current of electrons will flow through the wire between the two terminals. When electrons pass through the copper wire, they generate an electromagnetic field around the wire. We can actually see that by placing some magnets around the wire. When we pass electricity through the wire, the magnets rotate. When we reverse the direction of current, the magnets will also reverse and align the opposite way. So we can create a magnetic field which acts just like a permanent magnet, except this type we are able to turn off. The problem with the electromagnetic field in a wire is that it's quite weak. But we can make it much stronger, simply by wrapping the wires into a coil. Each wire still creates an electromagnetic field, but they combine into a much larger and stronger magnetic field. That's why we use these to create the coils around the rotor. If you find electromagnets interesting, then check out our video on how to make a solenoid. You can find links to that in the video description down below. The coils of wire are known as windings. The simplest DC motor has just a single coil. These are a much simpler design. The problem though is that they can align magnetically which jams the motor and stops it from rotating. The more sets of coils we have, the smoother the rotation will be. This is especially useful for low speed applications. Therefore, we normally find at least three coils in a rotor to ensure smooth rotation. Each coil is positioned 120 degrees from the previous. Between each coil, we find a commutator plate. Each coil is connected with two commutator plates. The plates are electrically isolated from each other, except that they are now connected via the coils. So, if we connect the positive and negative terminals to two of the commutator plates, we can complete the circuit, current will now flow, and a magnetic field will generate in the coils. The rotor, or armature, is made from multiple discs of iron which are laminated together. Each disc is electrically insulated from one another with a lacquer coating. If the armature was a single piece of solid metal, large eddy currents would swirl around inside. These are caused by induced electromotive force, or EMFs. The eddy currents affect the efficiency of the motor. To reduce the eddy currents, engineers segment the rotor into insulated discs. This way, the eddy currents will still flow, but they will be much smaller. The thinner the disc, the smaller the eddy currents will be. The commutator consists of small copper plates which are mounted to the shaft. Each plate is electrically isolated from one another as well as the shaft. The end of each coil is connected to a different commutator plate. In this design, each commutator plate is connected with two coils. The plates deliver electricity to the coils. To get the electricity from the battery and into the plates, we have some brushes which rub against the plates. The brush arms hold these in place. When we complete the circuit, electricity will flow into the commutator segments via the brushes, and then it will flow into one or two coils as a path becomes available. At certain points in the rotation, the brushes will come into contact with two plates. This will create an arc and we get these small bursts of blue light as this occurs. These arcs, as well as friction, will eventually destroy the brushes over time. Something we must understand is Fleming's left hand rule, and for this we need to use our left hand in this funny shape. You need to remember that Fleming's rule uses conventional current and does not use electron flow. Conventional current is from positive to negative. We use Fleming's left hand rule to work out which direction the coil will push and pull as the electromagnetic field interacts with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. If we look at a wire and visualize which end is connected to the positive or negative, we can work out the direction of force. 
To do that, stick your left hand out flat with your palm facing you. Think of these as being your thumb, then fingers 1, 2, 3 and 4. First of all, close fingers 3 and 4. Point finger 2 to the right, so it's perpendicular to your palm. Then point finger 1 straight ahead, and point your thumb upwards. Your second finger points in the direction of conventional current, from positive to negative. Your first finger points in the direction of the permanent magnetic field from north to south. Your second finger will point in the direction of conventional current from positive to negative. Your thumb will then point in the direction of force. Now I've made a PDF guide for this, which includes some worked examples to help you remember it. You can find links in the video description down below for how to get your copy. So if we look at this example, the conventional current is coming towards us and the magnetic field is going from left to right. So we point our second finger towards us and the first finger in the direction of the magnetic field. Our thumb is therefore pointing upwards, which means the force on the wire will move it upwards. In this example, we have the conventional current reversed in the wire, so it's moving away from us. Therefore, we flip our hand over, so our second finger is pointing away from us. Our first finger still points in the direction of the magnetic field, and our thumb points downward. This means the force on the wire will move it downwards. If we wrap the wire into a coil, how will the forces act now? Well, we need to consider the coil as two halves. On the left half, the conventional current is flowing away from us. So our hand flips, and we see we get a downward force. On the right side, the conventional current is flowing towards us, so the force is upward. Therefore, we have a combined upward and downward force, so the coil will rotate. So now we can see how the motor rotates, so let's have a look in detail. OK, let's consider the operation of a DC motor in slow motion. I'll just point out the main parts. There's the north and south magnets, which concentrate a magnetic field through the center. In the center, we find the shaft. Attached to the shaft, we have the rotor. Wrapped around the rotor, we have the coils. Connecting the coils, we have the commutator. And providing power to the commutator, we have the brushes and brush arms. And finally, we have a power supply. The rotor, coils, and commutator are going to rotate. Everything else will remain stationary. We are going to be considering the flow of conventional current and the forces which are occurring in the long sides of each coil. That's this side and this side. We'll also label these coils 1, 2, and 3, and the commutator plates A, B, and C. In this first position, the conventional current will flow from the positive of the battery into plate A, then through both coils 1 and 3, through plates B and C, into the right brush, and back to the battery. The right side of coil 1 has a downward force, and the left side has an upward force. Coil 3 has an upward force on this side, and a downward force on this side, and therefore it rotates. The current now flows through plate A and into coil 1 only. It then exits via plate B. This creates an upward force on the left and a downward force on the right. The current now flows through plates A and C, through coils 1 and 2, and into plate B. Coil 1 has an upward force on the left and a downward force on the right. Coil 2 has an upward force on the left and a downward on the right. The current now flows through plate C into coil 2 and into plate B. The left side of coil 2 has an upward force and the right side has a downward force. The current now flows through plate C into coils 3 and 2 and it exits via plates A and B. This gives us our upward and downward forces on the coils. The current now flows through plate C into coil 3 then out through plate A, creating our upward and downward forces. The current now flows through plate C and B, through coils 3 and 1, and out through plate A, giving us our forces on each side. The current now flows through plate B, into coil 1, and out through plate A, which creates our forces. The current now flows through plate B and into coils 2 and 1. It then exits via plate C and A. The current now flows through plate B into coil 2, and then out through plate C. The current now flows through plates B and A and into coils 2 and 3, and then out through plate C. This then repeats again and again like so, 
which gives us a rotating force which we can use to drive things such as fans, gears, wheels and pulleys. If we were to reverse the power supply, then we reverse the current and that will also reverse the forces and thus the direction of rotation. Ok guys, that's it for this video, but to continue your learning then check out one of the videos on screen now and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn as well as theengineeringmindset.com.